Hogstock. Hey everybody, welcome to the Hogstock. It is your host Alex East. I got Steve Thomas. I've got Jamal. I've got. Did you have to uh, think about uh, it for a minute? What's yeah, it? I don't. Well, so here's the thing. I have like eight windows open, and I can only see you. So I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm that level of dumb. If I don't see a person's picture, I, I forget they exist. I'm like a shark or something. I don't know. <laughs> um. All right, guys. Welcome to the show. Uh, it is one week before training camp gets kicked off. I, I'm starting to get geared up again for, you know, covering this team for another year. Uh, you know, I feel like we don't really ever take breaks uh, on, on doing the podcast. You know, I've missed a few shows. Jamal's missed a few shows. Steve doesn't because Steve just is always in his house. Uh, well, I've part. taken this show on the road many, many times that people right. aren't aware. <laughs> right, right, right. But you basically only go visit you know, your family, and that's about it. You don't really do vacations. Oh, in the past year, there's six months, there's been a reason for that. But yeah, yeah, regardless. sure. Yeah, sure. But I'm just saying, yeah. like, that's kind of just, you know, you're a See, homebody. Here's, well, it's not so much that. I mean, I am, but the other thing is when you're a practicing attorney in a private law firm, there's no such thing as vacation days. Right. There's not, I, people need to understand this. There's not a vacation policy in a law firm. That's for right. the staff there is, but for attorneys, there's not a policy that says you earn this many days. You don't earn, you earn zero days, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so it's very hard to get away because they tell you, you can go, but you got to still do all your work and the, your bill hours don't change and you need to answer all your clients. And, you know, so it becomes difficult or they just say, you can go, but we're not going to pay you. Yeah. Which then I, I, triples the I, cost of your vacation. Right. I have a couple attorney friends. They prefer the, I will go on vacation and just not get paid route. Because they go do crazy things like they go hike mountains in Europe and stuff See, like that. Yeah, I don't do the let's not yeah. get paid route. That's um no. Yeah, yeah, that's but, not your style. But I get it. <laughs> in my current job, I now you get have vacation. I do because yeah. then I work for a governmental entity as an right. attorney, and so I have vacation. So yeah, you got to figure happy. out something to actually do. I have like, a bunch of plans, Alex. I'm just oh, not going to say them on this show. All yeah. right, all right. You're not going to tell us what what well, not on the air. Or one, not, what's no. one plan. <laughs> What's, what's that? one plan that you can? I said, what's one plan that you can? That I'm, you not, can I'm not going into. That. I'll tell you guys off the air what the, the plan okay. is. I'm not going into all that. Hedonism. That's where Steve's going. <laughs> yeah, no, I can guarantee you that's not the. That certainly isn't the plan. It's not hedonism. All right, all right, but, all right. Well, why don't we get into the hedonism that is being a fan of this team? This is the like probably the last quiet week we're gonna have. So the fun of hey, struggling to figure out what to talk about. Uh, we don't have to do that after this week, which is nice. Um, not a lot of stories about the team this week. They, there was a thing with the NFL. They did the annual Madden ranking releases, which is always a little fun. We were going to kind of do a little uh, training camp preview uh, for the show, as well as we got to cover special teams for our final position group. I'm going to say dealer's choice, though, guys, and I'm going to give it to Jamal. Well, Jamal, anything no, you no, want to no. talk I'm about? I'm going to take no, but no. <laughs> the first thing is I want to talk about the fact that the team denied us and seemingly many other blogs access as credentialed media to training camp. Okay, we can talk about that a little. I know and we then, talk, then we a, and then Jamal can pick the round robin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jamal can pick the next topic, but I want okay. to make do this up front because I think it's a height of pettiness um for a team that's been petty for years. Mm-hmm. Um I, you know, I just don't understand how, I mean, what are they afraid of? Uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, are they only letting in beat riders who are more or less sick of fans for the team because they have to stay in good graces with them? And well, they don't want be, people yeah, like yeah. us who don't care, you know, what we say. Are they that afraid? I just think it's really pathetic. No, uh, well, yeah. this, team, this team in the past had their beefs with those big media companies, too. You know, yeah, that, and no, they it's a ran him out ago. of town too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I got a thousand things that I could say about this. It's so frustrating, and and for context too, because I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this isn't like a random complaint about their favorite football team. Like you all have to like sep- separate the actual play on the field and understand. Like we're talking about 
public relations side here. Mm-hmm. Um, we have had access to the commanders for uh, prior to, to be honest with you, prior to this new regime. Well, and, we, at, at one point, too. at yeah. one point, no, I about to say, hold on. At one point, we thought it was the pandemic that changed the mm-hmm. policies up that wouldn't allow us to get access to the team. That's um, what we were told. But prior to prior to the last prior to COVID, we mm-hmm. we had access for the last for three years, 2017 up until 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, we even had access to events. We had access to practices. We had access to mini camps. Um, all these things that we had access to. And I think um, what's what's so frustrating for me, a person who lives in the DMV area, um, the hog size asked me on multiple occasions, as well as Alex, because he lives in the DMV area as well, yeah. asked us on multiple occasions to cover events. Uh, we've gladly done it. Uh, the Washington uh, Redskins at times have also reached out to us about the possibility of covering events. We have gladly accepted, and they gave us all the access that we needed um, mm-hmm. to cover teams and all these things. And I think the, one of the more frustrating things is understanding over the last two years, not 2020, because we kind of understood that no access, whatever, COVID. Um, but 2021 uh, is when things started opening back up. And then 2022, everything is opened up fully. But guess what? Uh, the, the the people that got the short in the stick are the bloggers um, and the fan websites who mm-hmm. actually had, who shown a proof of concept that they can cover the team accurately when they get access to the team and they're able to speak on it. And I'm not saying that we can't do it accurately right now but what we're saying is we're more informed because we're actually there like it doesn't matter what an espn person said and you know I, I, i'm not spe- specifically calling out a john Conn because that's that's my guy he's helped me out a lot but i'm saying yeah. like it doesn't matter what an espn says or nbc sports says it doesn't matter what um uh, uh the athletic it doesn't matter what the washington post it doesn't matter what they say if you all come to the hog side for information because guess what there's a person there who has been covering the team who's been boots on the ground talking mm-hmm. to players understanding what the coaches are saying seeing what they see in practice and translating translating that or or uh, uh displaying and uh expressing what they're seeing on the podcast platform and you all have taken that away and yes i'm frustrated I, i'm not going to sit here and tell you that i'm not frustrated and it may take me a couple of days to get over it maybe even a week cuz i'm so i'm so pissed off i've even reached out to people on their side that actually still is there prior to you know the new regime change but I reached out to them to to try to see if we can try to figure something out or even get an understanding and, and like a point blank understanding of what's going on. But my idea is they don't want people who doesn't have like the 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 resume or the 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 journalistic and the quote unquote journalistic integrity that some of these people have because all of a sudden uh, the narrative may change or they may not have the the means to to uh, get in line quote unquote like what they're doing. And to be honest with you, we have never shown like a, a disrespect to anybody. We have never stepped out of bounds with any type of thing that we've been doing. And I will never forget the uh, the 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 mini camp practice that we were able to attend this year. We were invited mm-hmm. out as a fan. And I started tweeting out information. The same thing that I do at every practice that I had access to. And they sit and all of a sudden I'm getting uh, 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 nudges from the, the PR team saying, hey, can you delete your tweets? Like, what the fuck do I got to delete my tweets for uh, in my head? I'm sorry for cussing, but I'm just saying, what do I got to delete my tweets for? Uh, and then the next day, the actual uh, p- uh, journalists, the reporters come in, the beat reporters come in, do the same thing that I do, and they're putting out information the same way that I am, but I have to delete my tweets. Like, come on, man. None of that none of that makes up, makes sense to me, and I, I know what the issue is, and, and it's so frustrating, but um, I, like I said, I go on for days. I, I just, I got... I. They don't they don't trust us. They don't respect us. And I'm trying to figure out who is the person over there that is putting that is telling PR we're not allowing bloggers in. we're not allowing uh, the smaller websites in uh, or anything like that. I'm trying to figure that part out. Look, it starts. First of all, it starts at the top, you know, team leadership, owner, team president, general manager, Ron Rivera, one of those guys. Uh, for sure. I mean, I, I don't disagree with what you said. I would add into that that we know it's not just the hog style. It's not our business to disclose other websites, business yeah. and stuff, but it's not just us, um, number one. And number two, I think it's less of a resume thing with the team and more of, you know, they can't really, at the end of the day, control us. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of these other media outlets, um, uh, you know, they have a little so- more control, yeah. 
Yeah, they do, you know, because, uh, look, I mean, the, the Redskins were in a war with the Washington Post for a while, and they treated the Washington Post horribly, the mm-hmm. sports staff, because of it. And, you know, they have – we don't have a financial interest in this, and so – uh, we just, you know, we don't really care, <laughs> you know, in terms of there's no ability to control us in that way. And I think that's what it is, is they can't really sort of guide the narrative. And, yeah, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, the, you know, uh, you know, like Jamal in his tweets saying the same thing the beat reporters are saying. Well, the beat reporters have a vested interest in not pissing them off, and we really don't. Yeah, uh, you well, know, so I, I mean, just think that's... it's more stupidity from a team that's done nothing but stupid. Right. Look, at the same time, I also realized there are there are plenty of guys who are beat reporters who probably annoy the team more than not. You know, you think of the Chris Russells of the world and how he was doing it for years and uh, all those guys at the post that we talked about. Rick Snyder's very openly critical over the years of the team. And, you know, they but those are guys with such cachet that they can't deny them. At first, you know? I thought it was just me, but I don't think it is. No, no, I don't think it, it's just you. I. I would be interested because I don't we don't know all the you know what they send to everybody. You know, there's yeah. certain blogs and podcasts that are way more homerish than we are. I will be curious if they got in. And that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking yeah. they only want the homers. Right. There. So it, and I'm not going to name names because even the ones that are homerish, you know, well, they're your, nice. you guys do your thing. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and, and they're nice guys online for the most part. So, you know, I'm not going to, you know, have. I'm not going to give them crap if they got in, but, you know, I'll be interested to see if that's what happened or not. Um, yeah, it is frustrating because we did have that relationship. By the way, you want us to be less negative. Get not giving us access isn't helping. You know, like when when we were out there covering in Richmond and stuff like that, we were totally fair. And, we, uh, you know, down we the were, line, we were probably more pro team than than we would be otherwise. You yeah. know, if, if I. You know, it's not like I wasn't the, I when we interviewed like Chris Thompson or whoever, it's not like we weren't asking just a bunch of nice softball questions. You know, we would go in depth about play and stuff like that, but it's not like we're, you know, going for gotcha stuff. We weren't sandbagging these guys. No, no, of course not. If anything, we were probably, you know, pumping them up. You know? <laughs> like, I don't think we ever did an uh, interview with anybody that was na- other than uh, who Nate Sudfeld. I. I gave Nate something felt a lot of crap. Remember? I, I, was like, I, I you're remember not you very interviewed good. him. I don't remember what you said, but <laughs> I said something along the lines of, look, you're not very good. So how are you getting better? <laughs> <laughs> so that the Sudfeld family probably doesn't like us, but beyond yeah. that, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And enough. Yeah. I don't want to spend an hour railing about this, but I did want to bring it up up front and in, in mm-hmm. Washington PR, if you're listening, screw you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, why, why don't we talk? Let, let well, Jamal I said pick. it was dealer's yeah, choice. Yeah, let Jamal pick. <laughs> All right, Jamal, you got training camp, special teams, or men ratings. What do you want to talk about? Let's do special teams first. You want to? Do- <laughs> He's not <laughs> excited at all. It sounded like that's a chore. It, it's also the kind. It's uh, that part see, kind I of the day. I ain't even that. Just goddamn team, man. Let's go ahead and get to the special team. <laughs> We're gonna get it out of the way. Okay, look. So, yeah, obviously we know some of this is easy, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Tressway is the punter, the greatest player in Washington history. Joey mm-hmm. Slice, the kicker. Cameron Cheeseman is the long snapper. None of that right. is a surprise. Um, the, and, and just to knock Tress out of the way, he is, uh, has three years of his contract left. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and punters tend to have big cap, bigger cap hits, so he's at a little over $3 million cap hit. Um, I'm surprised how big punters cap hits are getting these days. Honestly. Well, that's because there's not a lot of people that can punt a football at a not NFL not 50 level. yards. No, yeah. No, I could punt a football. It would be 20 yards into the side. <laughs> you know, because I've tried. It would be a shank. Yes. <laughs> By NFL standards, it would be. Um, yeah. Anyway, Joey Sly's got 2.4 million dollar cap hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, they cut Brian Johnson, the lead singer of ACDC. <laughs> Right. So there's only one kicker. He was getting up there in age, man. Like, you know. yeah, I know. But Brian's <laughs> like, he's got to be 65 at least. Um, Cameron Cheeseman, long snapper, drafted last year. He still yeah. has a deal. So that is that. Um, but I, I think where we, that the discussion would be who's the returner. I, I think that there, there's that. And then you're going to see a big change up as far as other key special teams players uh, because DeShazer Everett's gone. Uh, you know, like he was the team's captain 
for a couple years uh, on special teams. So like that, there's a big gap in these other positions. Um, so talking about uh, kick returners, punt returners, when I looked around online, three names are kind of who come up for the special teams kick return game. Uh, Alex Erickson, who's the seven year veteran that they brought in from Houston and he because he's done it before. He's kind of going to be that safe bet. Uh, see if, if no one else works out in training camp and, you know, maybe it's just this is the guy for the year. Uh, but the other two names are two younger guys. Jared Patterson, I saw his name listed, which I would find interesting just because of his size. You know, like he's a smaller, like bigger buffer guy. Like we haven't had a, a guy like that returning punts and kicks in a long time, not since Rock Cartwright. Uh, and those guys can be interesting because they don't always go down on the first tackle. If they build up a head of steam, they, they can get you some extra yards. Uh, the other name was Dax Milne. Uh, you know, the now the now uh, boyfriend of Zach Wilson's ex-girlfriend. Uh, Say that what? Was the, yeah. So Zach Wilson, his best friend, he he got dumped by his girlfriend and she is now dating Dax Milne, which is an interesting thing. Isn't Zach Wilson the guy who was who's sleeping with his mother's friend? Or Supposedly. Something? Well, she, she leaked that after she dumped him. Oh, okay. It's yeah. like as the world so turns. Dak, here. Yes, Dax Milne is involved in a weird love triangle situation with the Jets quarterback. <laughs> so, you know, that that's the only thing he's got going for him. Has nothing to do with his play on the field. <laughs> They're passing football groupies around. That's what's yeah, happening. Yeah, yeah. At BYU. Um, I'd like to yep. throw one more in there. So, Jaquez Ezard. Okay. Now, Jaquez Ezard, 200, 2022 undrafted feature from Sam Houston State. Most of you probably don't even know his name. Mm -hmm. um, at Sam Houston State, you know, and he also spent um, four years at Howard. So, um, so, so he it, he's, been a, he's Houston? older. So okay. he spent 2016, 17, and 18 with Howard. Missed right. 2019 with an injury. Transferred to Sam Houston. 2020 was the coronavirus year, and remember, everybody got a free year out of that. And then right. he played 2021. So, so what what is he pushing thirty now? I mean, like that's a well, lot. I mean, he added basically had two more years, so six. Yeah. So he's probably like twenty three, twenty four. I I'll, gotcha. I have his birthday in front of me. I'll look it up in a minute. Oh, okay. Because um, I keep I track that, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, um. Anyway, so he had twenty eight kick returns at Howard, averaged twenty point eight yards per return. That's not great, but punt return he was better. Fifty two mm. punt returns, averaged twelve point four yards per return. So I think that. Certainly, Jaquez himself personally would be, I would assume, want to be considered. And I don't have his birthday. It was when I couldn't find it. Oh, okay. That's so nice. I think he's another one that you got to throw in there and see who can possibly do it. Yeah. So uh, the last guy thing I'll talk about with special teams, and that is what I kind of mentioned earlier, the situation at Gunner and these guys who are, you know, This is Alex's favorite you. topic. <laughs> it, it's not, it's among my favorite topics with special teams. Uh, so the they have two draft picks. I mean, obviously, Troy Apke is still here, and this is all they have him for is to run down the field really fast and not make a tackle because he always runs past the guy because he doesn't know how to you know take angles. But they have Derek Forrest, uh, who got hurt last year, but a big reason he was drafted was to play special teams. And then uh, this year they drafted Percy Butler. Now, Butler out of Louisiana uh, – Really good defensive back in general, at least, uh, you know, in terms of his play at what well, I guess that's a mid major level. Um, but he has four, three, five speed, so he's outstandingly fast. Uh, and he loves playing special teams, apparently. I, I saw I was watching an interview with him, and all he was talking about was how he wants to play all four phases of the special teams game and that kind of thing. So I think he's going to be the guy who kind of steps into that role that DeShazer Everett used to have. Uh, he likes being physical. He likes, you know, making a hard hit on, in those plays. So that's kind of what we need. We need a bit of an enforcer uh, on the on the field there. So I, I, that could be the guy to watch. Yeah, I mean, look, it, I, sound coverage is always the most important thing. It's, it, as long as you can get – I think if anything – People need to take notes from Troy Aki and, and how to and how to and how to make plays on special teams because um, he's the constant. 
Um, I think Everett, I don't have too much to say about uh, a lot of people, actually, now that I think about it, on special teams. Gunners is special. First of all, special teams is one of the least phases uh, that people even watch on all 22. So mm-hmm. the only thing you can really count on is who got, who got back there first <laughs> uh, right. when you watch the game copy. Um, who got back there first? And um, I think one of the things with with special teams, if you can if you can get speed out there, but also people who can spit those double teams on the edges, uh, on the perimeter, um, mm-hmm. constantly, or even just know how to work it and have your 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 special teams coverage work in unison, then you're fine. Um, I do like the idea of um, uh, uh, Butler. I do like the idea of Butler. You know, just uh incorporating a, a team first mindset and being able to or being willing to uh want want to play all phases of special teams uh, and found a way to contribute immediately that's one of the ways that uh all young guys found a way to stay on the field and even mm-hmm. stay on the roster so um the more you you show your commitment and willingness to do things like that then i think uh it's it's a under underrated value for a team to have someone like him so um and that's that's for anybody around the league uh, having those people that that talk about it as freely as him and, and as willing as willingly as him. So, um, yeah, I, I think as long as you get down there and you can cover uh, and, and you can run and ma- mm-hmm. and make the tackle, like making the tackle is also the most important part. Like if you can get down there as much as you want, but if you ain't making the tackle or uh, like in your attempt you're missing, then I mean it, you're really not doing too much. Like you got to go down there and make the play too. Like that's that's right. one that's one that's one aspect that that people aren't thinking about either so as long as you can go down there and make the play or at least uh feed them or force them force them back inside or to to the rest of your coverage i think you're in good shape um so i guess we'll see a lot come preseason yeah um i think sometimes special teams doesn't get the credit it deserves it's kind of the redheaded stepchild of football a little bit you know if it was like an election you have republicans democrats and independents that you know, very few people get elected and people don't pay attention. That's sort of special teams. Um, but I think it's doing it a disservice a bit to, and we talked a lot there a bunch of, about a bunch of safeties and, and um, whatnot, but a lot of these linebackers, you know, if they want to be on the team, they're going to have mm-hmm. to be huge parts of special teams. Guys like the back of the roster guys, you know, Bryce Notre, Trey Walker, Milo right. Eifler, you know, Dejon Harris, these guys, need to figure out how to be important uh, pieces of the special teams battle in order to yeah. make the team. And so, and, and there's usually, a, it's safeties and linebackers, you know, and then you got some and tight ends. Some running tight backs ends also and, play a big role in special teams play. What's that? Tight ends also, because they have that same build as linebackers yeah, generally. So those, those are guys big. are the ones. And uh, so uh, who's going to, I don't have a clue of those you know, the linebackers is going to step up. But I think if you're interested in this as a topic, that's one thing to watch for in the games, who sticks right. out in the preseason games. I'm talking about who sticks out on special teams. Yeah. And look, uh, you know, there are plenty of guys in the history of this team recently. Will Compton comes to mind right away. Uh, guys who started out just playing special teams and eventually it helps them develop into a solid starter, maybe not elite, but, you know, well, they keeps them can, in the NFL, you know, when they the can NFL, develop, they can better. develop. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, the linebacker question is interesting. We have a lot of depth at tight end versus linebacker, I feel like. Uh, and so when you're putting together special teams units, those are the guys you usually have in the middle who are, you know, blocking on a punt, but then have to get downfield. So you usually want tight ends and linebackers rather than linemen because they're a little faster and. Um, you know, so that that's going to be a kind of a wild card because I, I look at the linebacker depth and it's a lot of unknowns. I don't know if it's fair to say there's a lot of depth at tight end. There's I a lot of names at tight end. Yeah. Whether or not any of them are any good, uh, you know, is another story. I mean, obviously, sure. Logan Thomas, he's not a special teamer. John Bates, I, if Logan Thomas is on pub to start the year, John Bates isn't going to be on special teams either. Right. Cole Turner. OK, I mean, rookie, but he's also kind of more of a pass catcher. So now you're sort of down to guys like Ganey Golden, Curtis Hodges, Armani Rogers, Samus Reyes. Right. Uh, whether any of those guys are good at special teams, I don't think anybody knows. So I don't know but how much Samus, depth that really is. Samus and AGG have 
uh, special team experience. Um, I, I mean, that's just for what it's worth. Um, yeah. Those are only two. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's that's where ADG primarily played because you know he couldn't sniff the field on offense. Um, but Shamus, uh, Shamus and, and ADG would be the two if they decided to keep uh, mm-hmm. select tight ends for special teams purposes. Yeah, look, good teams always, and I've said this every year we talk about special teams, good teams always have five or six guys, not including your punters and kickers and stuff, uh, but there's five or six guys who are also, you know, defensive backs or whatever, who they get on the roster just because they're going to be special teams. Absolutely. You know, uh, like any good team has those guys. uh, And when you don't, you get something like we had in that last year with Mike Shanahan, where we had like one of the worst special teams units of all time. And I think they allowed something like a record in terms of both punt and kickoff uh, yards allowed. It, it was, it was a really bad 2013. If you go back and look at it, it was awful. I went back and I think I might've wrote a column about this a while ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, about how bad Washington has been at times in special teams. Yeah. How good and bad both. Yeah, they they've had some of the most elite special teams players of all time and uh, some of the worst. Yeah, but not recently. I mean, yeah, Brian no, no. Mitchell. If you go way back, Mike Nelms. Yeah. You know, Rock Cartwright was a was a good solid kicker turner. Right. Um, Daryl Green on the few times he did it was obviously elite at it. And they've had some Hall of Fame caliber kickers. You know. Yeah, Mosley was a league MVP, which probably yeah. will never happen again. Oh, I guarantee you. It, I guarantee that will never happen again. Yeah, realistically. And yeah. it's funny because you look at Mosley's numbers by today's standards, they aren't that good. But right. um, back then he was elite, you know, and with sure. modern training techniques and whatnot, he probably would be up there in the 80 percent range or whatever. But point is, yes, well, at times. Right. Washington has had elite special teamers. That having been said, it has been a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, you know, like DeAndre Carter was a decent kick return last year, and I thought they should have given him a shot this year, but absolutely. That, I, I didn't understand. I didn't why understand they him walk. Yeah, I didn't either. I mean, he had um, 36 kick returns, 904 yards, the long of 101, which is the touchdown. Right. And he averaged 25.1 yards per return, which is pretty darn good mm-hmm. by Washington standards. He was less good at punt returns. Uh, but he still wasn't was decent, you know, because Washington has been atrocious. I mean, atrocious at punt returns for years. Mm-hmm. Aside from one time and who was, you know, for half a year when the uh, I forget what receiver it was, did it and was good. Oh, uh, what's his name? The little guy who got stabbed at the nightclub. I can't. Yeah, him. Uh, yeah, that yeah. guy was good for half a year. But yeah. beyond that, I mean, they've been horrible. And, uh, you know, so uh, um, Carter averaged 8.4 yards per return last year, which mm-hmm. is decent. Put him in the middle. And so they just let the guy walk. And I didn't re- I never really understood that because I don't understand half what this team does. So they're going to have to re- replace that level of production. One of these guys and there's I don't know if there is a clear favorite. Alex Erickson's the vet. No. Yeah. Granted, to Zezard, who knows? I mean, and, and Dax Milne. I mean, he wasn't that good at it in college. Right. You know, I don't know why anybody thinks he'd be all of a sudden become great at it. I mean, I, maybe I think they're desperately surprised. looking for spots for him since. He's yeah, no doubt about know. that. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, and God bless him if he does. Uh, and Jared Patterson, I mean, that's not really his thing either. So mm-hmm. it's just kind of weird. I mean, I think some of the decisions this team has made in the offseason, linebackers, kick returners, it's just bizarre. You yeah. know, I don't know what they're thinking. Yeah, I, I, I look. Every coach is going to build how they envision things, but uh, it's not it. This that kind of thing in particular is just not something I would understand. Like de-emphasizing your kick return game because field position is so important. Um, well, it's like you finally stumbled on someone who produced well, at good, least yeah. league average or slightly above average in the case of kick returns, and you just let a guy walk for a relatively minimal contract. I mean, yeah. and you replace him with the Jaquez Ezzards of the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't get it. And, and Tressway will still be a Hall of Famer, for, or a Ring <laughs> of Famer, at least. You know. He deserves to be. I mean, you yeah. laugh about it, and we like him because he did a cool interview with us one time and all of that. You know, we talked about his when he the one with the board game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's just a fun, goofy guy. Game. Yeah. Yeah, and so we he's a likable guy, but he's also an outstanding punter. Yeah, yeah. He 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 is, and you know he doesn't get the respect I don't think uh, league wide, but he is a top 
five punter in the yeah, league. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I yeah. haven't looked at the numbers, but and just for context, DeAndre Carter signed a one year, one point one million dollar contract with the Chargers. You're telling mm-hmm. me Washington couldn't afford that? Right. I don't get it. Right. It's just above above league minimum is what he's yeah. signed for. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he yeah, he's a vet. That's very close to league minimum. Yeah. So I, it's just weird. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, we'll we'll see how the returner situation shakes out. I'm sure in the next few weeks. Um, hopefully they find. Hopefully they look into one again because they kind of looked into him. Um. All right. Why don't we move on though? Uh, why don't we uh, let's do a palate cleanser before we talk about the key battle to training camp? Because I still feel icky about the training camp thing. Uh, so stupid story is that of course the Madden rankings came out. Certain people care way too much about them. Uh, I am no longer one of those people, but I do enjoy just you know pointing out some of the ratings. Uh, first off, let's talk about Carson Wentz. Steve, I know you don't really care, but uh, I, and I, I won't even ask you to guess his ranking. Guess around where he ranked in terms oh, of I could, overall quarterback. Yeah, I, I, I can't guess the numbers because I don't even know what they mean. But in the yeah. rankings, I mean, I think that Washington fans – value Carson Wentz at a much higher level than does the league, the league generally Mm -hmm. part of it is just homerism. Part of it is people hoping for the best. And and that's just kind of the nature of being a fan. And I think um, Washington fans tend to see the good and not the bad of Wentz. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I'm going to say that they had Wentz. This is EA sports. We're talking about here. Right. right. I'm going to say they had him ranked 20th. 20th Ooh. Jamal did you look did do you know I, what yeah, I, know I have no idea I know okay. it. that's why I ain't, I ain't gonna say yeah that. uh Steve you're 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 actually more bullish on him than EA Sports oh wow <laughs> EA they... has a, now his overall ranking is a 73 now this is a, what does that it's mean a, though okay everyone's on a it's technically low. zero to 99 scale but no one's a zero uh you know like everyone 73 like, and that good for a starter then no no, no. 73 is a better. You said like Lawrence Taylor would That's be like you 95 put or something, right? Lawrence Taylor would be a 99. Okay. Yeah, 73 is where you'd put a lot of rookie quarterbacks. Okay, so what, uh, how, where, yeah. where did that rank? I'm 26th. Like, so, wow. So even I was more positive. Tied right, for 26. He wasn't even by himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're <laughs> not with Zach 73. Wilson. That, that's fair. <laughs> um, that, yeah. I don't think – I think Carson Wentz generally – yeah, he has his problems – um, and we'll see about the leadership. I know Dave mm-hmm. Earl's written some glowing columns about sure. his leadership ability, which is fair enough. Dave's opinion. I don't, it, it might, he strikes me as a better leader than maybe we saw and gave him credit for in, in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it went badly in, in Philadelphia for sure. But I also, that was a long time ago and he's on his last chance and he's, right. he's done all the right things this off season. So I would tend to be more positive about his locker room leadership ability. So then you're down to arm. And I mean, he does have a strong arm. He was a pretty decent quarterback on the field when he had good pieces around him. So I think 26 is a bit unfair. Yeah. I don't know if it is though. <laughs> at the same time. Um, all right, I, again, I put him at 20. I mean, I think that's yeah. fair. I, I, so the thing that you never know with these rankings, this is why I don't care so much about the numbers. Every year, Madden tweaks it a little bit. So what a, what is a 73 this year may not be what it was in the years past. And Because I remember one version of the game where basically anyone who was a starter was a 90. And, and you know, like now well, it's ba- now that's like 90s are just elite players or whatever. Part of what I don't like about things like this, mm-hmm. and this is why I don't like PFF either. And, I, and, and you know, Madden is probably worse at this. They're presenting a number as if it's an objective criteria, as if it was created out of objective criterion, Mm. uh, you know, and it really isn't. You know, a lot of what PFF does are subjective evaluations created intentionally to look like objective evaluations, a catchable pass. Well, that's you can't measure that. That's a PFF dude looking at a screen and going, oh, it's catchable. You know, and my guess is that the 73 or whatever is mostly a subjective, a a, perhaps a stat base, but an objective 
Mm -hmm. subjective rather evaluation and so i don't like rankings like this sort of for that reason because they're sort of pretending that it's objective and it most likely isn't yeah Uh, well look they're they're doing uh best guess on a lot like the easiest one is probably speed to figure out like if you're like well this guy's a the hat the top speed is 99 yeah that you could objectively measure but some of the other stuff you couldn't and look i don't care one way or the other about ea sports at all it doesn't i mean i don't play it i don't know but mm-hmm. um, that's just generally speaking why I don't like rankings like that, it, sure. the numbers, because it just, sure. you know, how did, I'm too much of a stat academic nerd to, you know, not question those kind of things. No, I get that. All right, let me give you real quick the other notable Washington commanders. Uh, you got Terry McLaurin was in the top 10 of wide receivers. He was ranked at 91. Jonathan Allen also top 10 defensive tackles at 92. Kendall Fuller somehow was considered a top 10 cornerback, which I, I thought. I don't understand that at all. No, that one made no sense to me. Uh, ranked in 89. And, uh, of course, I, I just checked this one. Tressway is the third best punter at 82. So Just the uh, third? <laughs> yes. He needs just to be number third. one. Yeah, yeah. And and he needs to be a 99 at a punt, as a punter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the, the one funny thing that al- always comes to mind about uh, Madden is, you know, they have the tournaments uh, with these games. And I, I remember that there were well, there like fan tournaments and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Oh, OK. Uh, there was one I remember. I don't remember how long ago it was, but somebody used Tress Way as their quarterback because he's left handed and it gave him some weird advantage <laughs> in the running game. Uh, like it screwed up the system. <laughs> um, it it so blew the was, algorithm. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so that's always funny to kind of see that kind of thing. Hey, Tress is the uh, senior guy on this team. Yeah, yeah, yep. he's the veteran, yeah. the, the senior, the most senior player at this Chase point. Chase Rhea is one year behind him, but Tress is 2016. Yeah. I, well, what a great life, man. What, to be being an a punter? NFL punter? Yeah. I mean, you have to be on the field five plays well, a game, maybe, mm-hmm. you know, at its worst. You're never going to get hit. Uh, right. Odds are every once in a blue moon. You're making millions of dollars. Unless you're Sav Rocca and you really want to just go hit people. <laughs> yeah, right. But most of them are just going to punt and stand there. And, yeah. and, and even practices aren't that tough. You've got a ton, a billion in days off a year. You know, that, that's a great, you know, if you could come up with any one job that's like the highest benefit to effort ratio, it might be punter. NFL yeah. Punter. I mean, look, I, I, there have been plenty of interviews that Tressway's given where he's like, look, all I do is try and kick a ball as hard as I can every time. Yeah, I know. And, and yeah. That's his entire job. And it's yep. not that difficult. You know, we're not we're not talking about nuclear physics here. No. And his no. practices are light. He ain't got he ain't got to do too much at practice. And even nothing. The long right. snapper, the kicker, the punter, y'all ain't got to do too much at I all. I know. They just stand it's there and watch out. most of the time and then people, goof off on the side field. People always say, like, third string quarterback, but a quarterback still has got to sit there and learn every single play. You know, I mean, that's like, another one that's a high, uh, um, you know, um, benefit to output ratio. But I think punters got them beat well, by a But the third string quarterback still has got a lot that's of That's what I'm talking time. about. They yeah. still have to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? How many plays does a punter need to learn, or a kicker? You know, like maybe <laughs> the the one if they're gonna run a gadget right. play and snap the ball to the up back. Yeah, and, you, you gotta know, learn your gadget it. plays, you, and you've got to learn. All right, we're kicking. I want to try and kick it to the left or the right, maybe. <laughs> my guess is that the special teams coach is going to pull him aside every and say, kick it to the left. And he goes, OK, I mean, there's right. not really a, a something to learn out of that. He right. just it, still that's not a play ball. call. It's just no, you're told it's this. Yeah. hey, Tress, kick it to the right. Hit yeah. the side, the right sideline. OK, right. Kick it into the wind to the right and maybe we'll get lucky. Yeah. You know? Yeah. God and, bless and, him. You yeah. know, kicker more pressure because, you know, if you miss a kick, you know, Everyone's gonna come down. If I recall, I think Tress told us he was a real football player in college and st- or high school at least. I think he said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he played some defense or something. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, a lot of these guys who, you know, just play special teams like that were something else in college. Well, you know, Jamal knows this. So if school. you play high school football, there's usually not a dedicated punter. Right. I mean, if you have trust way on your team, you know, get lucky maybe. But most teams, like my team, the coach would just say, okay, who thinks they can punt, you know, in like spring yeah, practice? There. Yeah, yeah, right. And like Shoot, everybody my, would try it and somebody would be good mm-hmm. the best. Like, my high school is just getting around to finding a kicker, like somebody who actually taking it seriously. I've seen yeah. my, 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 my friends is a coach over there and 
Uh, he posted, he shared a video of his, of his, of his, uh, of one of his kids kicking a, uh, practicing kicking, and he he kicking like forty yarders. I'm oh, like, all right, I'm surprised you even get you can get that that much distance, but he's getting <laughs> yeah. forty yarders out there. You got to hang on to that guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually friends with the kicker at our, our high school, and it was basically they went to the soccer practice, said that guy's got the strongest leg, just just have him kick this ball instead. We re- and, literally in my team every year the coach would go, okay, who thinks they can kick? Yeah. Yeah, I, it doesn't and try to me. feel that I because I did it a couple times and he was like, no, you need to go over here. <laughs> well, what, what was the farthest? Do you remember? Do you remember? Oh, well, I don't think I tried punting. I think I tried place kicking. OK. And I don't think I even made one at whatever distance it was. So he was okay. like, no, yeah. no, <laughs> just yeah. no, <laughs> <laughs> just go away. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's place kicking tougher. I feel like even I, know, I can not embarrass myself as a punter. Sure. I can believe that. Punting, I feel like, is a little easier it, once you get a few reps in and you just get used to the. Yeah, I can you know, kind of punt yeah. a little bit. Place kicking, I can't do it all. Yeah. All right. Why don't we uh, why don't we move on uh, from the silly Madden nonsense? Uh, we want to go through some training camp stuff. Uh, just some real broad overview. What are some training camp battles you guys are kind of looking forward to seeing get resolved here in camp and in preseason? Uh, so I'm going to, we'll, we'll just kind of go around Robin. I'll start with you, Steve. Okay. Uh, give um, me w- your, w- just one, one thing that you're kind of looking for position battle wise. Okay. And before we get to that, just so everybody knows the schedule training camp begins on July 27th. It runs through August 20 or August 18th. It is in Ashburn. Alex tells me there was some sort of like fan lottery thing for admissions. So if you haven't already done that, I think you're out of luck. Yeah. Um, and then the, they are having one practice at FedEx Field on Saturday, August 6th. There's nothing in what the team put out about having a practice at Andrews Air Force Base like they've done. So I don't know if that is gone or what. Uh, but that's the schedule. So in terms of um, the storyline out of training camp, I'm yeah. going to forego the obvious because the obvious is Carson Wentz. Mm-hmm. But, you know, um, I think the storyline needs to be who do they have a middle linebacker? Mm. You know, is Cole Holcomb at least a league average middle linebacker? Is he only a strong side backer? Because I don't think he's a weak side backer particularly. The linebacker and core in this team is so weak because Ron Rivera has ignored it intentionally for two years. So uh, for me, is Cole Holcomb the guy at middle linebacker? Will one of these back of the roster dudes step up and beat him out? I think that, other than the Carson Wentz, which is kind of a given, right? That's the biggest story of mine. And and of course, if he got beat out middle linebacker, Holcomb then is just going to play weak side or strong yeah. side, you know? Right. Yeah. Now you want to do? You said the biggest storyline or just a storyline? Just one that sense. one that most interests you. I don't care. It might not be the mm-hmm. biggest because, like Steve said, the Carson Wentz is going to be the biggest. There's no that's question. That's yeah. the storyline. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, that's a good question, and you know, Steve kind of uh highlighted the biggest one. Um. I I don't want to. Re- I'll just say it to hell. I mean, it it is what it is. The the Buffalo nickel position. Um, mm-hmm. who's going to, I, I just hate talking about it so much, but it's, it's not, I mean, if that's you what they implemented like, for a while, Jamal, <laughs> or about yeah, BN, you were calling it BN. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say if, if they're going to, if they're going to implement it a lot, which they, I'm, I'm currently just in the process of, of just watching prior defense or defensive, defensive performances from last year, prior to all the injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, they, they do use it a lot. So Buffalo nickel, who's going to play it? Um, how's it going to work with? Curl essentially uh, being a box player, but also having a capability of, of covering slot 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 receivers and tight ends and stuff, and, and even uh, versatile running backs. So how are they going to implement it now? Like, are they going to be able to use uh, Derek Forrest in that position? Are they going to be able to use Benjamin St. Juice to keep their uh, one of their top draft picks on the field, a person who's physical and has good coverage ability? Um, I, I think that uh, if we're talking about uh, who can con- contribute right away is probably going to be uh, St. Juice or Derek Forrest. I think Percy Butler is a person that a lot of fans like, but I don't think he's ready yet. Based on what I saw, I don't think he's physical enough to stay in the box. And uh, his instincts are 
are a little slow in terms of what he's processing on the field. Um, I'm not saying he can't play, but it's more so about until he understands uh, a little bit more thoroughly what he's seeing and believing what he's seeing, then then maybe we can consider him being able to to play that free or even be on the field full time is, is what I'm essentially saying. Mm-hmm. So for me, uh, I, I want to know who's going to win that Buffalo nickel spot, who's going to be able to to uh, uh, solidify a position that uh, can can perceivably be interchangeable. I, I feel like stability would be more important. If you can have that one person there and have a backup if that person gets hurt um, or something like that. But uh, yeah, who is it going to be? Benjamin St. Juice or or Derek Forrest or Wild Card? Who knows? Yeah, I think it's a, maybe a bigger it point than people realize. I'm glad Jamal highlighted it because Landon Collins, for as much hell as he took, justifiably so because of his huge salary and it was a yeah. Bruce Allen signing and all that garbage. Um, he's actually the perfect Buffalo nickel type guy. And the fact that he's gone, I think is a bigger loss than maybe it appears. So mm-hmm. I think that's a good one, Jamal. Yeah. And I think there's no question. You both are pointing to it that that third linebacker or Buffalo nickel, just basically the, that spot is the biggest question mark on the defense. Cause quite literally we have no idea who's going to fill it. And it's not even clear who's competing for it other than some vague concept of maybe Benjamin St. Juice and a few other guys, Um, you know, and like when I went and listed all mine, that was, that was actually the first thing I wrote down was third linebacker. I think you got to throw Kalik Hudson in there. there, There's a lot of names I feel like, and they all do different things, which is interesting because I look at Kalik Hudson and what he did in college playing a similar role, but he mostly just blitzed the quarterback as that player. Michigan called it, called this the Viper role. Right. And I forget, there was another NFL player who did it for Khalid. And I can't remember who, who the name right off the top of my head. Well, um, uh, there was the guy from temple who kind of did it. Um, no, 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 no. Who, at Michigan. Oh, at the Michigan. Viper okay. who did the Viper role before Khalid Hudson is also in the NFL. He was a second round pick and I can't remember his name mm. right now. But um, so I think Khalid Hudson is, understands Another the role option, yeah. yeah yeah i mean he understands the role well because that's essentially what he was doing in right. michigan right he played he basically was a safety playing on the line of scrimmage the whole time and he's um, 5 11 224 has some speed yeah. you know so Khalid's yeah. not a bad play there there's so many guys who could do it and they all bring something different to the table it's going to be interesting yeah. um you know so the other th- the things i i wrote down uh, i'll give my 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 big one that I'm very curious about is going to be that backup QB battle, honestly, between Heineke and uh, the. Why am I just blanking on the guy Sam we drafted? Howell. Sam Howell, thank you. Uh, I'm very curious to see how Howell does in training camp and in preseason. Uh, I think that'll, you know, look. We all know if you somehow luck into a good quarterback, it changes your team. So you know, we drafted a kid who has some upside. I'm curious to see what happens. Uh, it's um, that simple. Sam Howell's problem is consistency. Sure. That was the problem in, in college is he would look great at times. He'd look awful at other mm-hmm. times. So, um, you know, what how do you get? It's hard to say, it, you right. know. So, yeah, I think that's an interesting one. And don't forget about Cole Kelly. I mean, certainly the odds are against him. But we said it before on the show. He put up, like, just stupid stats right. in college. And, yes, it was the offense and all that. Um, but he's a humongous kid. I mean, six seven. So mm-hmm. I, I I would say it's not totally implausible to think he ends up on the practice squad at a minimum. Probably not on the active roster this year, unless Heineke just looks horrible. Right. Uh, you know, then maybe or in- but, someone might get hurt. You never, yeah, you right. don't want it. But you know, those are those are. But just because in. of the such ridiculous stats he put up, I think he's got a better shot than perhaps a normal camp arm would have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any others? I, I only had one other that well, I, well, yeah, I have one. Another one would be, um, how big of a role does Brian, jo- uh, Brian Robinson mm-hmm. play immediately running back? Cause I've written about this. I've talked about this mm-hmm. on the show. Uh, Jamal and I had sort of similar thoughts on a pre, you know, a couple weeks ago on the show about it. Um, Antonio Gibson is not a traditional running back and I think he lacks some instincts. 
uh, particularly inside. And, and Brian Robinson's more of a traditional running back. He had a lot of success at Alabama. So I'd like to see, I'm curious to see what kind of prominent role he plays immediately. Um, and then the other thing is, I think Ron Rivera has been particularly bad at getting his team ready in the pre, his starters ready in the preseason. Mm. That, you know, I mean, last year the starters barely played, barely right. played at all. And I just disagree with that as a fundamental philosophy. I don't think you can play scared or play to injury. Um, you know, teams need to start fast. And I think getting the offense in particular, so, some real reps in a game or two to start clicking would be a big benefit. So I'm curious to see if Rivera changes his philosophy. He probably won't, but I'm curious anyway. But those two things are also in my head. Um, Jamal, do you have that? All right. It's a ton of things to think about. Um, I, I, I think uh, another thing with with guess to to figure how does the if anything, because I was gonna say defensive line as a whole, but it's gonna be hard until you see them like in contact, full contact, which you'll see in training camp eventually, but not right away. So I guess I'll see. Mm. I, w- I would like to know how Fedarian Mathis is faring in terms of uh like his his matchups with the professional offensive linemen. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, not even exaggerate. There's, uh, people who, who believe, I think that's more fair. There's people who believe that, you know, he's not necessarily, um, he's just simply a run stuffer and that he's not necessarily a versatile player or, um, they don't necessarily understand his athletic ability because he's six, four, three, 300 plus pounds. And, um, they don't necessarily understand, you know, what comes with that with, when it comes specifically to, for Darian Mathis, and um, I'm a huge believer in him. I, I like what I saw on tape. I like his athleticism. I like his uh, his quickness. His lateral quickness is pretty pretty good, and his hand usage is violent, and he's pretty physical. So I would like to see how it stacks up when the pads are on, and he has to go up against offensive linemen who's taking pe- taking on people like him uh, at his size, and if he can dominate uh, or or at least win majority of his matchups. I, I wouldn't even say dominate, but if he can win it majority of his matchups, I think that's something that's encouraging for fans. And I think that's something encouraging for the defense who needs a person that can win with his hands, who can stack and shed, who can locate the football at the zero tech, because when that uh, five down lineman package come out there, that, that uh, what I think they call it, the the money, so, some defenses call it the money, the money package. Um, I, I think that's kind of going to be important because uh, he's going to anchor up that middle and he's going to have uh, that Duran and obviously, mm-hmm. John Allen to the opposite side of him. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, and we forgot the most obvious thing is for training camp storyline is, is Chase Young going to be ready to practice? Sure. Is he going to be ready to play? I tend to think not just because it's an ACL, but I think that's a major storyline. Is he going to be ready to practice in any capacity? Mm -hmm. Is he going to be on the pup list to start the season? Because let's be honest. I mean, it's a big year for Chase Young. You know, yep. he wasn't that – he was good but not great as a rookie. Uh, you know, st- from a statistical production standpoint, he was terrible last year statistically before he got hurt. Didn't do, didn't make an impact. So I think this year for Chase Young is one in which he needs to show people whether he can take the next step and become an above average to elite pass rusher in the NFL – because if he has another year like he did last year, people are going to start talking about him as a bust. Uh, and I think the my my last thing that I had written down was, uh, you know, will we start getting a better sense of what this offense can be? Uh, you know, I feel like with the defense, while there's a lot of question marks, we know where they want to go with it. You know, they want to do this Buffalo nickel thing. They want to do a lot of five down linemen because that's the strength of the team. I'm curious to see now that we have a a quarterback that, you know, I think kind of fits what Scott Turner wants to do. Like, what is this offense really supposed to look like? You know, we we couldn't really get that with Heineke because he was limited. Uh, You know, he had a lot of positives to his play, but, you know, he he doesn't have the best arm. We all accept that. So I'm curious to see now that we have Samuel back. We've got a bunch of good players, uh, a lot of speed at wide receiver. 
got a couple running backs. Like, what is this offense really supposed to look like? That That's what I'm curious about. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, so what are your people out there? What are your big training camp points? Let us know in the comment section. That, that's not a, that's not a, the worst idea. We'll take your, <laughs> we'll take your ideas. If we see anything good on Twitter or whatever, we'll, maybe we'll even share it next week. Um, since we have a few minutes left, I want to bring up one more thing. And this is Joe Jacoby. Oh, so, yes. As I see, everybody thought it was going to be something heavy. I mean, it's just. Joe no, Jacoby. no, no, it's not heavy. Um, so as I was scanning through Twitter for the, essentially the first time in a week uh, this morning, it's Saturday morning to see what stories there were. I stumbled across a page by Lauren and Jenna Jacoby, who are Joe Jacoby's daughters. <laughs> and they started this because they, this was a new page started in July this this month to advocate for their dad to be put in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We're mm. obviously behind that. We've been behind it from the beginning. We interviewed Joe about this on yep. the show twice. I've written at least three columns about it. We did all kinds of things. Um, and so the the tweet that I saw says, and that, by the way, this is at Joe Jacoby for Hall of Fame, and the name is Lauren and Jenna Jacoby. So everybody go follow that, follow them. Um, but the tweet I saw said, we need your help. Tell the Hall of Fame voters why Joe Jacoby belongs in the Hall of Fame. Include facts and data plus your fan memories. And they included a photo uh, of them. Do you think Joe Jacoby belongs in the Hall of Fame? Now's the time to tell the voters why it belongs. So the only way that the fans can make a difference is if they convince the senior committee voters. Right. That is how to do it. Now, I will put that – I will figure out who they are now and put that out. So it will be on our – I'll do – I'll update my column or something this weekend and put it out. So I think that's important because I think it's a travesty of football justice that Joe Jacoby, who is the archetype, the prototype – of the, the modern left tackle. left tackle. Yeah. Um, and fought with the greatest pass rusher ever in Lawrence Taylor on a regular basis. I think it's a travesty of justice. He's not a Hall of Famer. And it comes down to a bunch of New York, you know, anti redskin guys like, you know, Peter King are the ones who are keeping him out. Yeah. No, it's idiotic. And uh I'll I'll try and remember to even put that post in our uh Yes, you know, when, when we post the show, yeah. I'll I'll just try and copy that tweet and put it in there so people can follow it. Yeah, I, I made a little note, so hopefully I don't accidentally lose that note on my computer. Is it a mental note or a real note? No, it's a physical note okay. or it's a data note. I, I wrote so it down I would tend in my to doubt your ability to retain a mental note. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I, I do have like eight other things I got to go do. So. And Jamal, I mean, I'm you obviously are too young to see him play for real, but I assume you also agree he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't got, yeah, I don't have an argument against it. I kind of am familiar with, you know, the, I mean, because it's been a, it's been a campaign for X amount of years. So I'm, I'm well, well versed on the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I, I leave the fighting up to the people who seen him play because I can't, I can't yeah. make a real educated sound argument for him. I just understand the argument and, yeah. and understand his, his purpose. So. Hey, keep fighting the good fight, Steve, and you know, hopefully, you know, things come across for him, for him this year. Because I, I don't know when the voting takes place, but you know, yeah, yeah. it's a long process. I don't know how the senior committee thing really works. The the generally speaking, because I've looked into all this, I mean, there's a nomination stage, and then they whittle it down to semifinalists, and then they whittle it down to something like 15 finalists, and right. then those get voted on. But the senior committee is a whole separate process. Um, now, uh, we had Rick Goslin from the Dallas Morning News on the show a couple of years mm -hmm. ago and specifically about this, about Joe Jacoby, because mainly because he was the only voter who would respond and talk to us. Um, anyway, and Rick said on the show that I think it was on the show, not I might have been after, but oh, sorry, Rick. But anyway, he one way or the other told us that. If you get to the senior committee, the odds get even longer and it's harder because there are so many candidates out there. So the odds got worse for Joe. So it's even more important that you have everybody, everybody, you know, needs to contact the voters. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, well, hopefully that L Laura and Jenna can, uh, you know, make this push. And if we can find some of these guys names, we'll we'll put it out there. 
you know, they need more than 74 followers. I mean, their account's brand new. So everybody go follow them. Right, right. Uh, Actually, I'm since I'm looking at their account right now, I'll just retweet it and say, hey, everyone, follow this. Very good. Uh, You know, and I'll do it on my personal account even because, you know, I have multiple accounts. I I got Uh, you have a burner account, Alex. No, the hog site is my burner account. Oh, I'm about to say okay. the burner. Yeah, I'm about to say the burner account. <laughs> Gotta be the host. I don't know. Yeah, the hog site <laughs> is the burner. I have a real account with just my name on it, which, you know, that's where I tweet all my political and like satirical nonsense. Oh, okay. I used to yeah. have a legit burner account that I closed. Yeah. Because I was yeah. using it for a way to kind of scan the headlines in an easier fashion. Mm-hmm. Right. And then I realized it was toxic and. That was driving me crazy, so I closed it. And I always encourage everybody to get off Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Twitter's Unfortunately, I, I still find it very useful for finding information about this team. I just decided I could find it some other way. Yeah. All right, guys. That should wrap up this show. We will talk to you all next week as training camp. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I think we've probably come to a conclusion about uh, what we're going to do in the immediate future about the show. Okay. You want me to say this or no? Or we no, let's hold, we'll we'll save we'll save that for next week. Okay, never mind. All right. All right, guys. Cliffhanger. We will talk to, yep. <laughs> cliffhanger. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.